So at this point, we know that right, we have to take our victim, put them in the scanner, and what we're going to do is right, apply some magnetic field, B0, and then we are going to turn on some additional magnetic field, B1. Right, which rotates around here. And after we turn that on, we'll generate a rotation of the magnetization of this sample. Right. So we'll be able to generate some detectable signal. Now, at this point, in time, all of the magnetization is in a plane transverse to the long axis of the scanner. So if it were me laying down in there, all of my magnetization would be rotating around in a plane that bisects my height. What determines the frequency with which those spins in this person precess. They're rotating around. Anybody? The field strength of the magnet, right? So the frequency here is a function of the gyromagnetic ratio, which is a constant for whatever element we're looking at, and the field strength, which in this case is B naught. So it follows that in this example, this entire area is under the influence of this completely homogeneous magnetic field, which is the example that we've been going on, that no matter where you go in here, the magnetic field strength is exactly the same. Okay? And that means that no matter where the spins are in the sample, they process at exactly the same frequency. Okay, the, the reality is that that's not possible. Even if we could apply a totally homogene homogeneous magnetic field, and we spend you know, millions of dollars buying a very expensive piece of equipment that generates an extremely homogeneous magnetic field, the Bottom line is that when you slide the patient or the sample into this scanner, the interaction of that tissue with this magnetic field causes point-to-point -point variability in the magnetic field strength. And this has to do with something called the magnetic susceptibility of tissue, which we'll talk about a little bit more directly at the end of the week. But suffice it, suffice it to say, at any given location, the tissue causes some local amount of magnetic field that is in addition to whatever this static magnetic field is. So in addition to this magnetic field strength, there is some unknown and really unmeasurable amount of magnetic field strength that's a function of the interaction of that tissue with the magnetic field. Now this could be extreme if we have things like air or metal that are in the patient. But even if it's very homogeneous tissue, right, even in the liver from point to point, it's a big homogeneous organ, there is going to be variability due to these magnetic susceptibility effects, which means that there is going to be differences on a point to point spatial scale in the frequency at which those spins are precessing. So let's think about what this means. If, if we have our two spins, and again, talking about individual protons is a totally contrived example, and I'll address that in just a few minutes. But these are, let's say, right next to each other. So we have red and blue, they're right next to each other. 
And before we invoke this issue of this variability in the static magnetic field, what we've maintained is that you can turn on B1, generate some signal, and they are precessing in phase. Okay. Now, before any of this complication gets involved, we know that over time, there is going to be a loss of transverse magnetization. What is it physically, what leads to that loss of transverse magnetization? It means that the spins, which were all precessing in phase, and therefore their transverse components all sum to a large amount of net transverse magnetization, over time, they are progressively going to lose that phase coherence. And they will be completely out of phase at the point where they have lost all of that transverse magnetization. That's the T2 relaxation we were talking about before, right? That the thing that causes the net transverse magnetization to decline over time is simply that the spins are losing phase. The reason why they lose phase is because there is an energy exchange between spins that leads to a redistribution of our system to a lower energy state. The manifestation of that lower energy state is phase dispersion, okay? So it's all happening because of this quantum mechanical mechanism. Now, if we now make things more complicated and add in this factor that those two spins experience slightly different magnetic field strengths, because of the nature of tissue interaction, interacting with the magnetic field, then what happens is after we generate our signal, the spins are precessing in phase. So it's true there is a loss of phase coherence due to those T2 spin-spin interaction effects. But in addition, let's say the one represented in blue is seeing a slightly higher field strength than the one represented in red. Well, that means, right, that its frequency will also be somewhat higher, which means it will be processing faster than its neighbor, and over time there will be an additional amount of dephasing that is a function of the variability in the magnetic field that they're experiencing. So what that means is that if we plot what happens over time, We initially said that there was relaxation which looked like this. And this was 100% due to spin-spin energy exchange, right? our quantum mechanical relaxation defined by T2. And that this was in the setting of a totally hypothetically, albeit totally homogeneous magnetic field. But what I've said now is that there is an additional factor that also causes dephasing and is going on at the same time. And it causes our relaxation to look like this. Right? So whereas this is T2 relaxation, the real life relaxation is happening even much faster. And this we call T2 star. And the difference between these two is the component due to this variability in the static magnetic field, which is called, right, this leads to an effect called T2 prime. There's a relationship here for those of you who want to know. This is not an equation you need to know, but basically so it's the sum of the inverses is the inverse of T2 star. But basically just keep in mind that T2 and this T2 prime effect combine to form this T2 star relaxation effect. Basically, the T2 relaxation curve that we talked about is what's happening in our idealized situation. 
where the magnetic field is perfectly homogeneous. This is something you could never observe directly because you can never get away from the fact that there is this variability in the static magnetic field. What you actually observe or would observe in the examples we were talking about is this T2 star effect. At the same time, you could never see the T2 prime effect in isolation because the T2 component always has to be there. That's the quantum mechanical energy exchange between those spins. It's not something you can ever turn off. Now, it turns out that there is a way for us to compensate and recover at least the large part of the signal lost due to these T2 prime effects. But in general, if all we do is turn on our RF, generate some signal, and watch the signal go away over time, that that reflects the spins dephasing, having less net transverse magnetization, that is a function of both T2 and T2 prime, or when we look at it in the aggregate, at T2 star. Okay, so at this point, just following up on this issue of how the innate variability in the magnetic field is going to affect the signal that we detect. So there is going to be this point-to-point -point variability, and as, um, as I was asked during the break, these are very, very small gradations of magnetic field strength. In fact, they're so small that they're not the kinds of things that we could measure. When we go in and measure the homogeneity of the magnetic field, even with the patient in there, it's, it's quite homogeneous. But even these very subtle variations do have an impact on the processional frequency. And I think it really just drives home the point of how little a difference in field strength from point to point can be manifest as a significant change in the signal. Because if you compare, and I'll have an example for this, I think, tomorrow, of how the images look when you're looking at T2 as opposed to T2 star. There is a very significant decrease in signal to noise as reflected in these curves. There's just not really as much signal in those images. So we would like, uh, I think it's obvious, it would be preferable if we could be looking at the signal on the T2 curve as opposed to on the T2 star curve. And there is a way for us to do that. So before we do so, though, I just want to clarify one point. So in some of these discussions, you know, I sort of unavoidably move into saying, well, what if we think about these two spins or these two protons? And we already know that that's really not feasible, that's not possible, because quantum mechanics doesn't allow us to talk or even know anything about what those individual spins are doing uh, at a given point in time. But on the other hand, if we think about a sample that we might put in the MR scanner, which has right, many, many, many spins in here, many protons, and there is some externally applied magnetic field. And due to the presence of this magnetic field, right, there are going to be, and the interaction of the tissue, there are going to be slight variations in field strength from point to point across the sample. That's what we just talked about. Now, it is true that there is a sort of a continuous variability in field strength. But on the other hand, what is actually causing that variability in field strength has to do, right, in a given region, let's say, with the nature of the stuff that is in there. So, for example, if we talk about, let's say, fat, so it's actually the molecular structure of fat, and specifically the electron orientation around those molecules that interacts with this applied magnetic field to cause some local variability in the magnetic field. And there will be a relatively reproducible effect 
wherever we have the same type of homogeneous fat tissue. And this would be true for many other types of tissues, or if we want to knock it down to an even finer level of detail, for let's say specific populations of molecules will confer specific types of or degrees of variation on the static magnetic field. So what that means is if we have a sample, let's say this is a piece of, I don't know, myocardium, and myocardium is composed of you know, various different molecular components, we can actually make a list right, of what those components are, or at least theoretically we could make such a list. And each one of those components, whatever those molecular components are, is going to give a unique right, change in processional frequency. So it follows that within this sample of tissue, there is a whole collection of spins that let's say all are experiencing this same relative change. And they all function in or behave in approximately the same way. And as a result, these are often referred to by the term spin iso chromat. It's just a word, okay? The idea is that same color, like on a color spectrum, so it comes from, you know, this has some historical implications here, but the point of this term is that we will have groups of spins that based on the fact that they all experience the same molecular environment, all behave in the same way. That might be spins that are all clustered in a single location, but it's really even more likely that they are dispersed throughout the tissue, but wherever they are, they behave in the same way because they are experiencing the same environment. So when, I, you know, when we talk about these, you know, make these little hand signs to show you what's perhaps going on with these groups of spins, we're not talking about individual protons. We're talking about collections of protons and how they're behaving in the magnetic field. So for example, if we look at, let's say, two different areas, let's say fat and muscle, whatever they happen to be, or two different you know, molecular components of the sample, they start out, let's just make things simple and assume that they have the same number of protons per unit volume, they have the same proton density. So we're going to rotate these into the transverse plane. They are going to be precessing in phase, giving us net transverse magnetization. Now we know as soon as we turn off our RF, there will be this progressive loss of phase due to spin-spin energy exchange amongst the spins, and that's T2 relaxation. Let's put that aside for a minute and pretend, so to speak, that it's not happening. And I want to look instead at what's going on due to this difference in experienced magnetic field strength. So we have a scenario where, for example, let's say the fat is seeing a slightly higher field strength and processing at a slightly higher frequency relative to muscle. So over time, simply because of that variability in the magnetic field strength, there is going to be a progressive loss of phase, simply because the one in blue is precessing faster than the one in red. And after a period of time, there is a certain amount of phase dispersion, which if we would sample the signal now, we would have less net transverse magnetization or less net signal because of that amount of dephasing that's occurred. That's what is going on here where we're on this green curve. That's the T2 star effect.